question. Um, we'll do this like a build your own adventure uh, story. So part way through the talk, um, we'll bifurcate and I'll let the audience vote uh, which, which of the two halves they wanna hear uh, first. And then we might only hear that one depending on the timing. Um, so uh, let's see, you can put into the chat if you don't, everyone's being shy about turning their cameras on. Uh, so that's all right, um, but- Oh yes, uh, and please just ask question as we go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I was told this is informal and uh, like a jock talk style, so that's what I planned. So go ahead, put the name of this person into the chat. Uh, this, is a, this is a participant. I, I start teaching in a couple of weeks and I have to figure out how to interact with people on Zoom. So I'm, you're my guinea pigs, I'm gonna practice. So uh, there was, okay, so Eduardo has said, suggested that we have Wiener. So I guess I'll be easy on you all. I don't even know if any of you are, are actually at your computers or not. Um, so this one is, um, is Norbert Wiener. And uh, how about this one? Anybody know that one? McCulloch. Yeah, that's Warren McCulloch. And here? Yeah, Walter Pitts. Okay, good. Who's this guy? That's John von Neumann. Pioneer in cybernetics and uh, in computing. And I guess you got Alan Turing already. Um, Claude Shannon. Oh, yeah. So this is a slide I pulled just for fun uh, and to get us started on an informal basis. Uh, from a, a, a talk I gave in, in honor of Jack Cowan. This is Jack Cowan, my PhD advisor, um, who uh, was uh, served for 50 years as a tenured professor at the University of Chicago uh, and, and uh, played a huge role in mathematical neuroscience. Uh, the other reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is as a counterpoint to what I'm gonna, mostly what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, here's a little uh, image from, from the work of each of these, of these pioneers um, who had an impact on, in, in theoretical neuroscience. And every single one of them is what I would call a brain in a vat uh, theory. That is to say, it's a theory, in different aspects of um, thinking about how the brain works without taking into account interactions with the, uh, with the outside world, right? It's just, what are the possible properties, the computational properties or dynamical properties of, of, a, of a neural circuit uh, sort of in isolation? Um, and so since I, um, uh, well, the last 10, 15 years, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about the interaction between the brain and the body, and that's what motivates the, the stuff I'll talk about today. And so that's, I don't know, expanding a bit on, on um, the sort of classical computational neuroscience background. So here's the title slide, um, Neural Circuitry for Multilayered Motor Control. Hopefully that will make some sense by the time we get to the end. Um, and I wanna acknowledge my collaborators, uh, at the beginning, so I don't run out of time at the end. Um, but uh, this is a mixture of experimentalists and, and mathematicians uh, all over the place. Okay, so here's the first part of our, our informal exercise here. Uh, so um, the work that I've been engaged in involves studying the brain and the body and their interactions together. Um, and it is a lot easier to just study neural circuits by themselves, uh, cortical circuits or whatever sort of neural circuits. So I thought, then this is an experiment. If you, if nobody wants to participate, then we'll just move on to the next part of the talk. But uh, if you would like to unmute yourselves, I thought we could have a little informal discussion. I know Bill's out there and Bill's gonna have something to say about this. And, and I, know, I know Eduardo probably does too. And the rest of you, uh, you know, some of you I'm not as familiar with as others. So let's start in the left-hand column. There are lots of good reasons not to study the brain at the same time as its interconnections with the body at the same time as that system embedded in the environment. So who wants to, to drop a couple of reasons why it would be a good idea to avoid doing that? And I'll call on random people if, if nobody chimes in. How about Eduardo? Do you want to? I mean, I, I prefer to study brain body environments as well, but I'd, I'd oh, imagine you'll, some you'll sort get of a chance. We'll, we'll do that next. We'll do that next. But surely you're familiar with some, some of the inconveniences. A number of parameters, just naively, like speaking. Okay. So more. Degree of freedom, more. 
number of degrees of freedom, good, or, or parameters. So for as far as parameter identification, um, right, you're gonna have a harder job if you have a higher dimensional system. That's true. Any other reasons? How about how about stationarity? Oh, Rupert, were you going to say something? I saw you briefly unmuted yourself. Go ahead, dive in. Um, yeah, the so on, the unpredictability of the environment. Predictability. Un, un, unpredictability. Predictability. Unpredictability of the environment. Right. So, so that, that would be like experimental control. It's hard to do a controlled experiment if there's all these uncontrolled or unpredictable or unpredictability. Good or un. Any others? Difficulty of instrumentation. No, we lost Peter, I think. Can you hear me, Peter? Okay, speaking of unpredictable environments, we have unpredictable connectivity. Um, there we go. Good luck. I'll go to the next column. Um, so why? Why would you try to overcome these sorts of obstacles and study the brain as coupled to the to the body, or, or even worse, to the environment? So, Eduardo, you said this is uh, this is where you prefer uh, to play. So, uh, what motivates you to to take on the that, 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 uh, the difficulty? I mean, I would say the motivation for me would be that this is what living organisms do in real life. This is how they operate. This is how they exist, no? So the is on d'etre, sort of, so to speak? Yes. Of the brain uh, and, and the body is that they, they do things together, okay. They evolve together, yep. right? So, uh, If you want to understand what the brain is doing. Tightly coupled. They're tightly coupled, yes. That is both one of the difficulties, but also one of the rationales. Good. Uh, and if anybody's you know, far away, you could, you could put something into the chat and maybe uh, you could share your thoughts that way too. That would be, that would be fine also. Um, okay, good. So I like all these, I like all these reasons. Um, I jotted down a few, a few of my own, um, pretty much what you said. Uh, the fully interconnected system is experimentally difficult to work with. Electrodes don't stay in place when the animal's running around, or at least it's harder to get that to work. Um, conceptually, there are difficulties. You have the perception action loop, right? The brain does something, then the body does something, and that changes the conditions. And, and your statistical dependencies are sort of going around in circles. Um, and and we, we saw the comment about um, higher degrees of freedom, more parameters and so on. On the other hand, we, right, we came up with the evolution idea, um, strong coupling. And then another one that uh, I find very motivating is that even if you could study what was happening in the isolated brain and really pin down the, the fundamental mechanisms behind some aspect of the neural dynamics, 
what if when you put the brain back together with the body, the same thing you were studying works in a completely different way? Uh, and, and so the two case studies that I have to talk about today are examples of exactly that situation where the, the fundamental mechanism that you identify in the isolated circuit turns out to have not that much to do with how things are happening uh, in the fully connected system. Um, okay, and there's been lots of observations. I mean, this is not a new observation of mine. Um, <clears throat> So if you're maybe some in this crowd, since this is San Diego um, at the Institute for Neural Computation, you're all familiar with the redundancy reduction efficient coding hypothesis that goes back, that originates with Barlow and then has been uh, you know, used to explain the properties of uh, cells, at least early in the sensory pathways, um, uh, even further into the sensory pathways. But the problem with um, uh, you know, thinking about natural scene statistics as a basis for organizing the brain circuits or the, the properties of uh, lower level brain circuits is that um, as you move around and explore, you're gonna be changing these statistics. This is sort of the, the perception action loop uh, problem. Um, the, the very statistics that are supposed to shape the structure of, uh, of everything depend on how the animal is behaving in the environment. Um, beautiful paper that I'm sure you're all familiar with since this came out, out of the West Coast, uh, Churchland, uh, by Mark Churchland, where the statistics of the neural activity, no matter what part of the brain you look in, totally changes when the stimulus starts. The variability, the mean doesn't necessarily change, but the, uh, well, it might, but, um, but the, the variance relative to the stimulus onset totally goes away. Uh, Jack Cowan made a similar point um, in a, uh, in an interesting paper that he had a couple of years ago. Um, so you've probably heard of the, the Wilson-Cowan equations. Uh, the, in the last 15 years, 10, 15 years, Jack has worked with a number of very talented students, more talented than me, to redevelop the Wilson-Cowan equations on a, as a fully stochastic system. Um, and you get all kinds of new and interesting phenomena. Um, but it, it turns out that the stochastic Wilson and Cowan neural networks do a great job of describing what's happening under spontaneous cortical activity uh, during rest, spontaneous um, activity in the, like if you take a chunk of the cortex out, if you're at rest, um, if you weakly stimulate the cortex, but it turns out if you strongly drive the cortex, okay, so you turn on a strong visual stimulus or you have some other strong drive, then consistent with Churchland's observation, um, what happens next is actually better described by the original ordinary differential equation or partial differential equation type wilson cowan equation. So the, the, the fundamental mathematical description of, what, of how you approach modeling um, the cortex in this case, or I'd say the brain generally, um, it can just be completely different. Uh, the appropriate context can be completely different when you have strongly coupled brain body interactions. All right, so in order to make progress on understanding uh, brain function as a theorist with this, uh, these issues that have to do with brain body coupling in mind, um, one has to work with tractable systems uh, so that you can actually get somewhere. And I have two different projects that I'm, I'm ready to talk about, whichever one you would like. This is the one where you can, where you can vote. Um, so one, nice case study of this brain-body interaction is um, the mammalian breathing system. Okay, so the goal of the breathing system is to get air to come into the lungs and uh, oxygen into the bloodstream. And it's driven by this little part of the brain back here the, uh, in the brainstem. Um, there's a respiratory control center. And, uh, and so we, we did some modeling work to try and understand whether or not the control of breathing in the isolated brainstem preparation, which is where most of the experiments were done, at least originally. How is that related to the control if you actually put it inside a closed loop uh, control system where it's sending signals to the body and getting signals back from the body? So that's story number one. Story number two is um, about this beautiful creature here, Aplysia californica, the, the sea slug. Um, it's already led to one Nobel Prize for learning and memory, synaptic plasticity. Um, and what this 
my, my collaborator at Case Western, Halal Chiel, studies the biomechanics of rhythm generation and feeding in the sea slug and can do some amazing experimental uh, interventions that you wouldn't be able to do in a mammalian system. And um, what the slug likes to do is it likes to eat seaweed. And so you have this repetitive process of swallowing the seaweed and they do things like pulling back on the seaweed while measuring the, uh, uh, the, active, the changes in activity in the neural circuits as the slug deals with this, um, this obstacle to what it's trying to accomplish. In both of these systems, we have strong brain body interaction uh, what attracts me as a mathematician working on these things is in both cases, there's a well-defined goal that you can, you can quantitatively say how well the system is performing. In one case, it's uh, maintaining um, the blood gases, oxygen, CO2 within some nominal range. In the other case, what you're trying to maintain a steady rate of, of taking in seaweed into the animal. Um, so in both cases, there's, a, there's a, like a complicated system, but there's a one or perhaps two dimensional objective function. And in both cases, we have a central pattern generator um, involved in producing this activity. So this is a kind of brain circuit that uh, doesn't create extremely complicated patterns. It, it has a modest uh, repertoire of patterns. Well, that's interesting. I said, do not disturb. And so all these announcements are not supposed to happen. Lesson learned for class. I have to be more aggressive about that. So you get to vote. Um, go ahead, put in the chat uh, whether you would rather hear more next about breathing or about uh, slugs chewing on seaweed. The simpler of the two systems, says Eduardo. Terry wants both. We could do both, possibly. Breathing, okay. Slugs, slugs, slugs. Uh, the slugs seem to be carrying the day. So I'll jump to the slugs and then we'll come back to the breathing. Um, and we'll see how the time goes. And I know, uh, actually, uh, Frederick, is this a one hour session? Oh yeah, but we can easily extend uh, another half an hour if people are interested. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I won't be offended if people leave, people may be leaving and I won't even notice. That's a great thing, the difference between Zoom and a classroom. Um, as long as there are three people in the room, it'll, to me, it'll look like it's full. Um, but I, I'm available beyond the hour, so I'm happy to keep going as long as people have questions. So let me jump down to um, the sea slug since that seems to be, uh, okay, I see Carter there. Good, so I'll come back to the pre and complex story later. And here we go, okay. <clears throat> right, so here's a Plisia Californica. Now, um, uh, when Hillel and I write grant proposals, which we do from time to time, we sometimes get the question, why should we fund work on invertebrates? And just in case any of you uh, might ever have occasion to ask yourself that question, there's lots of good reasons. Basically everything we know about the brain was discovered in invertebrates 20 years earlier before it was worked out in mammals. And so, um, you know, you can look into the future of neuroscience by, by funding invertebrates. Uh, here's some examples, the uh, action potential, generation, noise synchronization, right? Uh, Terry's here, um, uh, beautiful, beautiful work that actually got me, is what inspired me to come uh, pursue computational neuroscience as a career was, uh, was Terry's work with Zach Minan and uh, uh, Brian and Segundo 20 years earlier were able to demonstrate something uh, similar in Aplysia Californica. It didn't get as much attention because it wasn't in, in mammals. Um, and plesia are a lot easier to work with, so it's possible to, to get things up and running. Um, synaptic plasticity, neuromodulation. Okay, I won't, I won't bore you with all this. Um, now, I'll show you a movie. For those of you who are not steeped in slug culture, uh, I'm gonna show you a movie of the slug swallowing seaweed. And to do that, I have to switch to sharing the screen on my laptop, but that will just take a second. Okay, so that goes right over here. Good. Okay, so that was a painless transition. Here's a sea slug. Um, it likes to eat seaweed. In the forceps, there's a little bit of seaweed and it can, it can taste it. It's got a very good chemo sensation. So it knows it's out there. What you see is the, the little, um, the, the, the lips open and this little grasper comes out, that little white thing with a slit in the middle. There's a bunch of little teeth, uh, embedded on the surface of that, giving it a rough surface. 
and it uh, reaches it forward and tries to close it down on the seaweed. And uh, here Claude Weiss is uh, just teasing it. Um, in this picture, this is from the uh, Claude Weiss's group at Mount Sinai in New York. Um, here the, the sea slug has gotten its, uh, its jaws on a strip of seaweed and it's rhythmically pulling it in. So it, it uh, reaches its mouth or its grasper forwards. It reaches the grasper forwards open. It closes on the seaweed and it pulls it back. Just like if you were hauling uh, something up hand over hand, if you were hauling a rope, um, pulling a bucket up out of a well, you'd reach forward with your hand open and then you'd um, close down uh, before exerting a force to pull backwards. Um, okay, so with those two movies in the pocket, I will go back to sharing from the other device. Okay, so I will stop sharing here and then I will share over here. And here we go. Okay, good. So that'll come up in a second. <clears throat> so here's the kind of data that, uh, that my colleague Halel can record. Um, uh, four different channels, um, uh, typically hook cuff electrodes in, in this in these recordings, there are some intracellular recordings as well. Um, and he puts a cuff electrode around the I2, the, the nerve that's innervating the I2 muscle, um, the radular nerve, buccal nerve two and buccal nerve three. And uh, in biting, biting is an attempt to grasp food. So that's when you're reaching forward, you try to grab the food and you, you, you miss. And so then you try again. There's a, the, the, the neural activity is noisy but there is a discernible pattern. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, bites. Uh, I2 is the pro a muscle that protracts. So it pushes the grasper forward to try to get to the food. And then the uh, on buccal nerve three, for instance, you have uh, activity which is retracting. So it's protracting and retracting. And you see a similar repeated pattern six times, although there is a lot of variability. Um, now, once you've, once you've grasped the seaweed, then again, you, uh, you repeat a similar series of motions or you, you open, protract, grab, retract, and repeat. Um, and you see a similar pattern of activity, uh, although again, it's quite noisy. And if you pull on the seaweed, so they can, uh, uh, they devised a way to attach nori, um, seaweed you would use in cooking, onto double-sided uh, sticky, uh, double scotch tape so that they can actually pull back on the seaweed. And then the slug has to work harder to, to pull it in. And so then you see this more intense activity compared. So um, the retractions are more intense and so on. Okay, so that's the kind of data that we've got. Um, they can go through and they can extract larger and smaller units and identify um, uh, several different units on each channel. And so they use these temporal landmarks to, um, to, to to be able to break down what's happening into a um, more detailed description, and so uh, this is the this is the data that that really got me hooked on this project quite a few years ago. Now, um, in this case, we have we have a biting pattern, we have a fictive biting pattern. So this is where the central pattern generator, if you will, the, the neural circuit that is driving the motor output, has been um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a partially reduced preparation where they've dissected out the mouth parts and the nerves connecting it and the part of the brain that drives it. So it's most of the slug is now missing. A lot of the sensory feedback is missing, um, but you can still produce similar patterns. And there, uh, you know, if you look at the patterns in detail, basically the same events happen at the same time uh, in the same sequence, but with slightly different timing. And if you plot, um, equally spaced points in time here. This is these three axes are, are the rectified voltage uh, from three of these channels. And you see that you sort of, um, you come down here and then you have a bunch of points up in, in this corner and then you have a bunch of points in this corner and then you sort of make an excursion and I don't know, maybe you have some points in this corner. But um, there's a mixture of 
regions where you move quickly and then regions where you, you sort of have a metastable state, then you move quickly and then a metastable state. And you see similar uh, collections of points um, in all three preparations. So this one is the partially reduced. And then this one is where they completely dissect out the, just the, uh, the ganglion that drives the, the, uh, uh, the feeding pattern. And now the mouth is gone, the sensory feedback is gone, all the nerve fibers are gone. All you've got is just a collection of a dozen or so cells. Uh, one of the strengths of aplysia, for those not familiar with it, is that they have identified neurons. So you can repeat the same experiment with exactly the same cells from one slug to the next, from one, one week to the next. So in this case, where everything has gone except the central pattern generator, you see a similar pattern of activity, but the, the, the bursts are much more intense than they were under the more natural uh, uh, experiment. And so, and you also see a longer time scale. It's a little bit hard to read, but uh, this is 10 seconds here, and this is 20 seconds. So these burst patterns are, the whole thing is slowed down, almost as if the neural dynamics has a built-in fixed point, and you wait at that fixed point until you get a signal from the body telling, okay, you've done that long enough, now it's time to go on to the next part of this motion. And if you don't get that signal, you wait a long time before you move on anyway. Okay, so we thought, well, what kind of system, what's the simplest kind of system that would do this? And we came up with a, um, a model. Oh yes, this is now time for the, the chalk talk, chalk talk part of it. So um, we said we we put together a model with the following general kind of structure, and then I'll give you the details for some of the details for Plisia. So we're thinking about um, the neural activity as a vector. There's a couple of different uh, pools of neurons, and uh, the neural activity obeys some dynamics. If you took the body away entirely, this is like what we're seeing in that slide where with the completely isolated um, uh, uh, buccal ganglion. So then in addition to that, we've got the body. So I'm gonna to lump together all the variables, the muscle activations, the locations of the, you know, the grasper along the protraction, retraction axis and so on into, um, uh, into X. So A here is the neural activity and uh, X is all the body variables. So F here is the intrinsic dynamics. H would capture the biomechanics. And in some systems, the biomechanics give you an intrinsic degree of, I don't know, stability or robustness. Uh, you've all seen the, uh, the, the, the movie, um, I suppose, where there's a little, uh, there's a ramp and there's a little creature. Um, it's like, it's made of, of just bits of metal welded together and it sort of swings its arms and it walks down this ramp. Um, and there's no, there's no neural control. There's nothing but the intrinsic biomechanics, but it sort of sways back and forth and takes, goes step, 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 step. So that's sort of what's happening here with, um, with H. There's, there's some sort of biomechanics which in our case would be um, the muscles closing on the seaweed and pulling back and pushing forwards and opening and so on. All right, so if I just had a system like this, um, we're interested in a situation where this intrinsic neural dynamics is gonna produce some sort of rhythmic pattern like a limit cycle. So it's gonna do the same thing over and over again. And that means that this system would be getting an, a periodic drive, right? So A is coming in here and so then you could be periodically driving. And this is what we would call the open loop control of a rhythmic motor system. Um, because there's nothing, nothing from the body is going back up to influence the brain. Um, and for a specific task, you might be able to set something up like that so that it basically works. But then in, in the real world, I think when we were discussing pros and cons of, of embodied uh, neural modeling, um, someone mentioned the unpredictability of the outside world. And the unpredictability is an issue for the sea slug too. Um, the seaweed that it feeds on in the wild comes in all different shapes and sizes, thicknesses and, and resistance to swallowing. And it's operating in a tidal zone where there's you know, water 
uh, pushing it around. So there's a variable load here, which we're, we're just gonna think of that as a, an additional term that's disturbing the, the biomechanics. So in, in this case, if we pull on the seaweed, then that adds a force that, that changes the way the seaweed moves. That would show up as part of the body variables. And the way it deals with that, or part of the way it deals with that, is by adding another term, which is the sensory feedback. Okay, so um, F is the intrinsic dynamics. G is the sensory feedback. H is the biomechanics. And L is the external load. And basically what the brain is trying to do, or the brain and the body are working together to try and continue to do the motion that it was designed to do, despite having these external loads. So it wants to be robust against these external loads. Okay, so that's, that's a little bit of chalky talkiness. All right, so here's the specific uh, model, which I don't think it's a good idea to go through it in a lot of detail. If you're familiar with um, the lock of Volterra equations, uh, uh, it's, it's basically a mixture of quadratic and linear terms representing inhibition and self-excitation. Um, so there's, we have three neural pools, uh, one associated with um, retraction. So this is the phase when the, um, the, the, the grasper is pulling back on the seaweed. So here you see a little bit of seaweed and this is a cartoon to illustrate the different phases of the model. There's the grasper here is this red thing that can open and close. The blue muscle is, is a uh, muscle that when it contracts, it pushes it forwards. And then this uh, muscle that, that loops around like a donut, when that contracts, it pushes it backwards unless you've protracted very far forwards in which case it pushes you even more forwards. But that's, I won't get into that. Uh, context dependent muscle activation or muscle effects now. So we've got, um, we've got an internal dynamics and the internal dynamics produces, it has three fixed points. And in the absence of any other uh, uh, influence, it produces a limit cycle, which is very close to a heteroclinic cycle. Meaning it takes a long time to go from one fixed point to the next fixed point, and then to the next one, and then to the next one. And that recaptures this, what we see in the data where there are these extended dwell times at certain points in, in the phase space. Um, okay, so uh, another important aspect of the model is the nonlinear length tension curve. So the, the, um, the, the, neural, the three neural pools drive two muscles. One muscle is just protracting and retracting. Uh, there's a question, have these three neuronal populations been identified in aplysia? Um, Yes and no. So the, the individual neurons, uh, the individual neurons have been identified. So um, uh, B6 and B9 are involved in retraction. Um, B3 is involved in retraction and it's recruited uh, if, 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 this, if the slug encounters resistance and it needs to increase the amount of force, then it activates this additional retraction neuron. Um, uh, B4 and B5 are sort of command neurons that are influencing how the other neurons, uh, the timing of the other neurons and so on. So many of these neurons are identified that we, are, that we associate with the, the different neural pools, um, but there are some overlaps where this neural pool um, has some cells are both in that neural pool and another different neural pool. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to do a one-to-one -one association. We are working now, we've just, we've just gotten uh, uh, new funding from the NIH to work with people who are doing um, uh, detailed you know, voltage clamp recordings of multiple cells uh, to try and marry our higher level models with, more, with lower level models. So um, we, we expect to replace this uh, sort of nominal model with, with more detailed models um, in, in the near future. Okay, so what this model does is um, it produces a, uh, it can produce two different kinds of limit cycles. One where 
the, if you think of the neural activity uh, as, as three different pools, each of which has a firing rate that goes from zero to one, as it has a maximum firing rate, then the three pools together live inside a three-dimensional box, a cube. And there are fixed points, uh, uh, saddle points, so uh, not stable, but stable in two directions, unstable in one direction, saddle points in three corners of the box, namely when one neural pool is on and the other two are off. So for instance, here, uh, the A0 neural pool is on and the other two pools are off. One has just switched off and the other is about to switch, to, about to turn on. Um, so there is one mode where the oscillation sort of occupies the middle of the box. Uh, and you don't really run into the, uh, run hard into the walls. And there's what we call the heteroclinic mode where the sensory feedback drives you into the wall comprised, uh, comprising uh, the firing rate being zero. So if your firing rate is zero and you're getting inhibited, your firing rate doesn't become negative. You just stay zero until the balance of excitation and inhibition changes and then your firing rate can become positive. So the, the golden trace here, for example, that's, that's the A2 neural, uh, neural pool. It's being held tight against the wall during this region. So what you get is a limit cycle, but it's made of these, these components where you, you sort of slam into the wall and then you are dragged along the wall for a while and then you're released. We call it a limit cycle with a sliding component you get something similar in, uh, say, uh, uh, bipedal or quadrupedal locomotion, where the foot makes contact with the ground, and all the dynamics are different when the foot is moving freely versus when it's um, weight bearing. Um, okay, so also the grasper opens and closes, and when the grasper is closed on the seaweed, then it feels a force. It, it applies a force to the seaweed, and it feels a force if the seaweed is resisting. Um, so in these plots, the thick green line is where the grasper is closed on the seaweed and the, the thin line is where the uh, grasper is open. And then we just assume during those parts to, that the seaweed is not moving. So you can see here the seaweed is going in and then uh, the grasper opens and, uh, and resets and then the seaweed doesn't do anything during that period. And then when the grasper closes, um, it actually, there's a phase where it's closed while protracting and then it retracts and then it protracts open and then it protracts closed for a bit and comes back. So it actually pushes the seaweed out a little bit before pulling it in. And in the case where it's sitting in the middle, um, it's not, the sensory feedback isn't strong enough to push it into the wall and it actually loses seaweed. Going down means that the, the, the net rate of seaweed is, is out instead of in which is not good for the slug. Okay, so um, uh, those two different situations occur to whether or not, they correspond to whether or not you actually hit the wall. Um, I'll skip over that. Um, and so now what we were interested in is the robustness of the system. So if we started pulling harder on the seaweed, what happens? And the, the interesting thing we found is that the mechanism of control seems to be in the timing rather than the timing of, at, at the, in the neural system, the locus of control is in the timing, as opposed to um, any other aspect of the neural activity. So if you plot the three, we're plotting the activity of the three neural pools here projected down onto the, uh, the uh, plane perpendicular to the vector one, one, one. And the black and green are two different force levels. And you see that the, um, trajectories are almost exactly the same as a set of points, but in terms of the timing, um, when you are in the retraction phase, uh, you spend longer in that phase than you would when there's a higher force. And so what happens is you, you're delayed, your overall cycle length is delayed, but you use that delay to build up more and more muscle strength because the muscles are slow and it takes time for them to develop adequate forces that corresponds to the muscle properties in aplysia. And so the way the system responds to pulling on it with a bigger force is it pulls longer and stronger. Um, and so you can see there's a change in the shape of the trajectory here in the components, in the body components. There's a change of timing in the brain components and a, ch a change in the, the timing and the shape in the body components. Okay. so. Um, that launched us into a whole 
uh, different set of mathematical questions about how do you study the shape and timing changes of a limit cycle system when you change a parameter. And I won't uh, get into that story now because we don't have the time, but uh, we just got word today that a paper has been, our, our, a paper was accepted literally this afternoon in uh, the SIAM uh, Applied Dynamical Systems Journal, where we, where we basically figure out how to handle this problem. For those who are familiar with the, the infinitesimal um, phase response curve, we've invented something we call the infinitesimal shape response curve, um, which is sort of the complementary object that tells you how the shape of the trajectory changes in response to small perturbations. So basically, I won't walk you through all of this, but you have a parameter, which in this case is um, the force applied to the seaweed. And when you uh, increase the force, there's a change in the way the brain and body together produce a response. And we can tease apart the aspects of that that have to do with timing, and the phase response curve comes in there, and the shape. So uh, just as a, as a sort of a, a toy example here, here's a system with, which has one of these limit cycles with a sliding component. You, you crash into the wall, you drag along the wall until you reach a certain point where you can lift off again. And there's a non-smooth transition. This is like when the grasper opens and closes, that you change the dynamics um, uh, across this boundary here. And so when you change the parameter, you change where and when you lift off the boundary, where and when you cross the switching surface, uh, where and when you, you run into the hard, the hard boundary. And so you have to take all that into account. Um, and we've come up with a way to do that. Okay. Um, uh, excuse me, Peter, like how fast yes. are those changes like uh, and parameters? Like how quick did you study like the, the some, some range or like? Um... So what we're doing is um, uh, in, the, in the model, if you apply a certain force, then the, 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 the brain body model will settle into a limit cycle. And that limit cycle will have an average rate at which the seaweed gets sucked in. If you, now you increase the force, then there'll be a new limit cycle with a new rate of intake. And that's our objective function is how, um, you know, how much does the, does the rate of change, the average rate of change vary when you increase the force. So it's two separate experiments and you can think of, uh, and, and the average rate of intake is something you would measure mathematically over infinitely long times. So we're not looking at how rapidly, we're, we're not doing the, what you, I think what you're asking is, suppose that I'm applying one force and then I, I you know, instantaneously increase the level of force. Exactly. How quickly does, yeah. So we're, um, Experimentally, it's very tricky to do that. So we haven't tried to answer that question because the amount of force, you know, um, what, what they have is a force transducer and the, the double-sided uh, scotch tape. And so the force transducer can measure how much force the slug is applying, but that's not the same thing as applying a specified amount of force to the slug. Yeah, yeah. Right, it's holding onto the side of the tank with its foot and it's pulling on the, so they do an experiment where they either feed it seaweed um, and they measure how all, all the neural activity and they don't pull on the seaweed. So it's just whatever the viscous forces are is, is present or they, they anchor it down so it can't, it actually grabs the seaweed and lifts, starts to pull itself up out of the tank until it realizes it's not coming and let's go, it tries again. So um, Jeff Gill published a paper last year in eNeuro where he did these force measurements um, and so you can compare the neural activity during these. So you either produce a very large force in the lab or a relatively small force. So it's, it's, um, there's a little bit of a mismatch there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I have another chalk talky bit here um, uh, where I could, I could explain more about this shape response curve. I, you know, this is really, I mean, this is something that's very close to my heart, but um, it is kind of technical. And so I think I will wait until the end. I'll, I'll switch over to talking about the, um, uh, yeah, I'll switch over to the respiratory story. If anybody wants to know what I mean by 
the infinitesimal shape response curve, then I'll come back to the slide and I'll explain it in five minutes or something. I would Just propose that uh, if you're free next week, uh, you could use another uh, hour next week to talk about the more complicated system if it's okay for you uh it's just an option like it's up to you ah well um uh i could do that too um i'm not sure i, I saw I, be there I saw that terry i saw that terry wanted to hear about both and i don't know if he's free next week uh so i i would be happy to come back next week if you have a hole in the schedule um i will quickly check my own schedule just to make sure that that is an option it's definitely free we're doing every other week so next uh, thursday so it's open for you if you want i would love to come back sure that would be more relaxed um and um okay so then in that case i will stay with aplysia for a couple more minutes um and then we'll call it we'll call it a day and i'll still i can still stick around all right. So, and still, if people want to hear about the uh, this sort of analysis, I'm happy to go over that today. Um, all right. So the take home after doing that analysis is that, um, as I said earlier, when you apply a force, the the sensory feedback interacts with the biomechanics to produce the effect that um, the system pulls longer and stronger. It pulls on the seaweed for a increased length of time for the retraction period, which develops a larger force. Um, and that's actually observed um, in preliminary work. So this is now 10 years ago. Um, Kendrick Shaw, who is a student who sort of got us all started on this, uh, measured the, the um, duration of the uh, retraction phase for, for free seaweed versus holding the seaweed fast. And, and sure enough, uh, the other parts of the motion like protraction were statistically uh, indistinguishable, but the retraction phase was significantly lo uh, longer, which is what you would expect. Um, so more recently, this is a figure from uh, Jeff Gill's e-neural paper that, that, so I wasn't involved in that, but this is part of the collaboration um, uh, where, where he was um, uh, measuring not only these same channels, that I mentioned before, and identifying neurons like B6, B9, and B3, the, re the retraction neurons, and I2, the, the protraction muscle. Um, but he's also able to measure the force um, quantitatively in, in uh, millinewtons. And so you see this, this big increase in the force during the retraction. This is, oh, B8A, B8B is what closes the grasper. So when this is firing, that's when the jaw or the, the grasper is actually closed down tight on the seaweed. And during that, um, that interval of time, you see this big buildup in the force. Um, and uh, as, the, as, as the seaweed is not really coming in, um, they, you add on top of B6, B9, you add the B3. Okay, so there's a, more to say about that, but um, I'll, I'll stop. This will be my, yeah, this will be my last slide then. Um, so, uh, you asked about the, the, uh, whether these three neural pools I was talking about earlier are, 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 correspond to identified neurons. Um, and I mean, they sort of do and they sort of don't, but the next generation of model that we're building is based on uh, uh, taking the actual identified neurons and what we can tell about their connectivity to each other and to the muscles um, uh, and building, here we've built a, a simplified model in which the neural activity is just reduced to a Boolean on-off system. For well, one of the neurons is ternary; it can be off, on, or really on. But um, most of the neurons are either on or off; they're, they're just bursting or not. And um, by going through the the data, um, the, the hand scored data that I showed earlier, like these pictures here. We can we developed um, you know a Boolean representation where sorry about that um, where so B31 32 turns on that's the that's driving the I2 muscle so during protraction in biting you 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 this is where you push the grasper out B8A B8B um, I'm just turning on the wrong one okay uh, so 
there's I2, there's BAA, BAB, and then uh, that's with the grasp for closing. In this case, it fails to grasp food because it's a biting pattern. And then it, it retracts weekly, retracts and resets and repeats. Um, in contrast, in swallowing, you, you start, so in swallowing, it's already got its mouth on the seaweed. And so the first thing that happens is this B38 pinches the lips together to sort of hold the seaweed in place while it repositions inside. It, it opens and, and push the, pushes the, the grasper forward. So then this is the protraction where it pushes the grasper forward. You can see diagrams of the different muscles over here. Um, this is all, so if you want to go through this in detail, this is from something that we just published in Biological Cybernetics um, a month ago. And uh, once you've protracted, then during swallowing, you close down. So B8A, B8B here is closing the grasper. Now, when you close the grasper, it actually changes the shape of the grasper, and that changes the mechanical advantage of the muscles that are pulling it in. And we've incorporated that sort of element in as well. Um, B6, B9, and B3 are the retraction. Um, and so what we've done is we've, we've built a simulation in which the neural units are either on or off. The motor units are all continuous. So the position forwards or back protracted or retracted and the level of activation of the muscles, those are all um, uh, following continuous ordinary differential equations, but they're driven by this switching network, which is the bursting cells. And uh, the third motor pattern here is rejection. If, if the thing gets something in its mouth that it realizes was a terrible mistake, then it actually can push it out. It can open, retract, close, and then strongly try to, to protract while it's closed. And you can see here, if it's closed, and so B8A, B8B are active, closing the grasper and protracting at the same time. It's trying to get rid of whatever, whatever was in its mouth. Okay, so there's a lot more to say about that, but I think this is probably a reasonable place to stop. I do have a conclusion slide, uh, which is just the abstract I sent around at the beginning anyway, but so uh, hopefully I've convinced you that uh, there are interesting questions when you look at brain dynamics and biomechanics together. Thank you. So if you have any questions now, feel free to, to jump in. And um, otherwise we're going to do the second part next week. I will send another announcement, but uh, um, we're recording anyway. So if you cannot make it next week, uh, you'll be able to get the recording of the talk on the, the INC website. Uh, so please ask your question to, to Peter uh, now. Uh, I'll gather yeah, there's their thoughts. I've got uh, my email address in the chat too, if anybody wants to follow up uh, afterwards. Yeah, go ahead, Rupert. Hi, Peter. Yeah, um, I was just wondering about this um, longer and stronger force that uh, you're talking about. Uh, a couple of things about it was how does the, the slug know to apply a stronger force? And as I understand, this is when you're holding the, the seaweed on its mouth, is that right? Yeah, so when you, uh, we assume there's some force resisting being consumed. And if you increase that force, then um, that changes several different things. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. The first thing that happens is that, so if you, if you compare two trajectories, uh, to directly answer your question, we don't know how the slug knows or, or even how the model knows. That is to say, it's in a sense, it's an emergent phenomenon with, with a couple of different components to the explanation. So here's how we currently understand it. If you, if you can look, you can superimpose the trajectories with two different forces. In the model, when the, um, when the grasper is open, the difference in forces doesn't matter, right? Because the force doesn't, you, you don't experience the force uh, or the force doesn't impact the uh, movement on the, on the forward backward axis unless the jaws are closed and you have contact. So at the same time, 
each of the two different uh, force conditions leads to a dissipative dynamics that gives you a limit cycle, which means that if you started with different initial conditions, you would converge to a common, a common cycle. So while the grasper is open, you have the same system with two different starting points converging. And so at the point of time when the grasper closes, that's where you begin to experience a differential in force. And in the two different conditions, that's at almost exactly the same point in terms of muscle and, and, and body and neural activation space. So what happens then? Now you, the, the, there's two different forces uh, in the two different scenarios. And the first thing that happens, of course, is that in the trajectory that's getting the bigger force, it gets pulled further out because you're closing and, re and extending out a little bit and then before you start to pull back. So I mentioned earlier that we have nonlinear length tension curves. And after 10 years of working with Hillel, who's very big into the biomechanics as well as the neural control, I finally, you know, in, within the last year, realized how important the biomechanics, this aspect of the biomechanics is. If you look at the two trajectories and one of them gets pulled further along and you look at the length tension curves, the properties of the muscle itself resists getting pulled out more strongly if you pull it out further. Right? It's like the muscle gets stiffer the more you pull on it. So without the brain having to be involved at all, without sensory feedback playing a role at all, the intrinsic biomechanical properties give a sort of built-in resilience where the increased force meets an increased uh, strength just because of the, the, the relative displacement of the, of the grasper and the muscles involved. The next thing that happens is the sensory feedback signals are different because if you're further extended and if, if what the sensory feedback is doing is it's basically keeping you in the retraction phase until you have retracted enough to go on to the next part of the cycle, that is delayed because the force, the same neural activity doesn't pull the, the mouth back in as quickly. And so the it's sort of like it accidentally, it's like it, it does the right thing without 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 knowing what it's doing. Um, and so the sensory feedback is different. The duration of the retraction phase is longer and the muscles are gradually building up their activity um, the longer that they're stimulated by the, the, the retraction closed pool. So all this works together to give the longer and stronger. It's not, there isn't any sort of central con uh, controller where the slug recognizes aha, I'm up against a, 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 a stiffer challenge here. I need to respond appropriately. It emerges from the interactions of the biomechanics, the sensory feedback, and the, and the neural dynamics. Okay, so I was just wondering whether you plotted the, the force which you're um, holding onto the seaweed with against the force that the slug is applying, whether there's correlation between, you can see any correlation between Um, so in the model, that, that, that force is the same, right? The Newton's law, the force that the seaweed is applying to the, the slug is through the grasper and vice versa. So those two forces are identical. In the experiment, um, you, you tether the seaweed to the force transducer, which essentially makes it immobile. And then you can measure the amount of force registered by the, the, by, the, um, by the servo motor, which is presumably the same as the amount of force that is say, if you put a tension meter in the middle of your, of your strip of seaweed, it would read the same in this direction as in that direction. So I think the, I don't think there are two separate forces. Now the grasper is connected by soft tissue to the head, which is connected to the body. And so the, the force is sort of, you can, you can build more complicated uh, force body diagrams. And that's exactly what our collaborator at uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Vicki Webster Wood, has been doing, who's the first author on this, on this most recent paper. But there aren't really two different forces. Okay. Uh, Leaf Gibb, oh, Terry writes, most studies of swimming in leech and lamprey don't include the body, but the ganglia can still undergo thick of swimming. Yes, absolutely right. 
And so in the, in the model, um, we have fictive behavior in the model as well. Uh, I mean, in the, in the real system, well, also in the model. So back in this, uh, in this situation here, um, this is, this is this, a similar kind of pattern in the completely disconnected uh, ganglion as in the intact animal when it's actually biting. But it's not exactly the same pattern. It's uh, distorted in terms of the intensity of the bursts and the timing of the bursts. Um, so fictive, and next week, I guess, I'll talk about fictive breathing. And it turns out fictive breathing has about the right frequency to match regular breathing, but it, not to give away the punchline, but the dynamical mechanism that generates fictive breathing in the brainstem is not the same as the dynamical mechanism that generates actual breathing in the closed loop intact system. So yes, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the swimming in the leech and lamprey, um, they produce rhythms that resemble the rhythms in vivo, but they might be producing them through completely different mechanisms. Uh, and I think uh, Carter Johnson is here. He he just uh, wrote a beautiful PhD thesis on um, you know the 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 role of biomechanics in producing the motions in uh, swimming of I, I believe it was the leech. So he could he could answer that in more detail than I could. Let me look now at C. Elegans. Yes. Actually, sorry, C. Elegans. Okay, okay, not the leech, but the C. Elegans do fictive, which don't, to my knowledge, do fictive locomotion now. I take it back. I, I sit correct. Okay. Uh, let me go on to Leaf's question. Which parts of this neural system in Aplysia show plasticity? Ah, very good. And on what time scale? <clears throat> so, um, yeah, there's all kinds of neuromodulation and variability and, and plasticity on, and on many different time scales. Um, if you start the slug out cold and you start feeding it seaweed, you go into the tank and you just start feeding a strip of seaweed, um, it, uh, uh, the bites get more vigorous as it kind of gets going. So there are mechanisms that I don't think are particularly well understood by which um, driving the muscles gradually increases their responsiveness so that the, the third bite or the third swallow isn't, it is stronger than, than the first two, just because the muscles were kind of, um, you, you know, you experience this when you first get up in the morning, you, you hop out of bed and you go for a 10 mile run. It feels different than if you're doing that at the end of the day. Um, so there's that kind of short-term uh, plasticity at the level of the muscles, um, but there's also learning processes that happen there's beautiful work by um, Avi Suswain at bar -Alan University in Israel, um, where he took seaweed and he put it inside mesh bags that were uh, inedible. That, that the, so the, he put it in the tank and the slug could smell that there was seaweed there because they can detect it, you know, uh, odorants through the water. They would crawl over to it and they would try to grab it and they would keep going for, I don't know, you know, hours, maybe half an hour or something. They, they would very persistently try to eat this seaweed that was being kept from them. And then like the next day, the same thing would happen. But if he repeated this experiment enough times, eventually they learned that that kind of seaweed, although it used to be perfectly good for them, uh, it was no longer edible and they would ignore it. So the bag would go in with that kind of seaweed and they would ignore it. But if you put a bag with a different kind of seaweed, a different species, they would crawl over and they'd have to learn that that one was inedible too. Um, so there, there is learning and plasticity uh, in in the feeding response of these of these organ uh, these organisms. I'm not sure if that was the question you were asking, uh, or something else. And in terms of the dynamics, I've been modeling the we we are not changing the muscle properties so that they get more vigorous uh, with repeated bites. Um, we could consider putting that in. Um, the, I don't think we have a large enough number of samples in the data 
to really get a quantitative basis for comparison. That's more a qualitative observation. In terms of the, um, the, the learning, that is happening with higher order command neurons that are not part of our model, uh, not part of the current model, but we're building them into the next generation of models. Okay, thanks. So I'll stick around as long as, um, as anybody has questions, um, but I'll also come back next week if that's what you would like. It's cheap yeah. to travel to San Diego these days if you're not actually traveling. <laughs> so I think, yeah, I will just have a, I have a last question. Just out of curiosity, are you considering building a spiking model of this uh, system or is it too, it's going to be too much uh, time consuming as you're interested in the, the timing of those. Uh... <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'm not building a spiking model of this system because someone else already has. Um, uh, Jack Byrne at the uh, University of Texas Medical Center in Houston and his group have been working on aplysia for oh, 30 years or something. And they're using voltage sensitive dyes and intracellular recordings and voltage clamp on the whole nine yards. So there's a series of papers. Uh, the most recent is by Cataldo et al, uh, two, 2020, I believe. And there was one by Costa et al, 2017, um, in which they are laboriously assembling a conductance-based, the, 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 the electrophysiology of the individual conductances is not the hardest part. It's the synaptic, getting the synaptic connectivity right. But they're, they're, they're doing all that. And so, they're building a model and, and we, I mentioned this NIH project that we've just started. Hillel and I are collaborating with Jack Byrne and with um, Avi Saswan and, and, and uh, Claude Weissman and, and Betsy Cropper. So we're all working together now. And one of our, our goals is to dovetail um, the conductance based model that um, the Jack Burns group has developed and is continuing to develop with our biomechanical models. Uh, oh, great. To, that's, that's, yeah, that's, I mean, we've just got, you know, I got the notice of award like last week. So it's early days, but within five years, we'll, we'll have something. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so yeah, well, uh, I will send another announcement uh, um, by the end of the week for like the, your follow-up uh, talk next week. Sure, part two. So okay. you don't need a new title or a new abstract, I guess. No, I will just say part two and uh, That's fine, okay. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much, Peter, again. Uh, yeah, no, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's great to, to uh, interact with this group. So I'm very cool. happy to be here. So Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Sorry? Thanks, yep. bye. Okay, thank you, thank Rupert. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. All right.